Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Subscription Scaled. I'm your host, Nick Frederick. With me today is Jeff Coyle, who is the co-founder and CSO of Market Muse. Jeff, welcome to the show. Oh, hi. How are you? I'm so pumped to be on the show today. Yeah, we're, we're psyched to have you. So thanks for thanks for coming on. Um, let's start at the beginning here. Tell us a little bit about yourself, about Market Muse, and uh, what you guys do. Sure. Um, I'm Jeff Coyle. Like you mentioned, I'm co-founder of Market Muse. Um, Market Muse is a content intelligence platform. It really sets the standard for content quality. So what we're able to do is analyze content to tell the story of expertise and how well you're doing that at the page level, how well you're building authority at the site level. So we're able to produce effectively on-demand content inventories and give people predictive ways uh, to define how they're going to invest in content. Um, so how much content do you need to own uh, to, to write or update uh, in order to own a particular topic? Where are your big risk pages? What are your quick wins? Where are more foundational long-term efforts? Um, so we market specifically to you know teams that understand that content has value and they're looking to sharpen the knife on what they are already executing, uh, but also get more predictive um, with their investments. And we watch teams go from you know, brainstorming to decide what they do all the way now to getting you know, predictive, saying, hey, we have to publish this many articles on these topics with this much depth and this type of internal linking and integration. And we watch those teams just like explode in a good way. Um, my background, I've been doing search, content strategy, product management, um, and uh, for now 24 years, as scary as that sounds. Um, and my background is in computer science. I went to Georgia Tech for usability theory and computer science. Uh, I've, built, I've built products in the lead management space, uh, lead generation. I've generated hundreds of millions of leads for B2B technology companies, both at KnowledgeStorm and Tech Target, who you might be familiar with. Um, and uh, work to private equity firms. And, you know, if it involves traffic going in and some form of value going out, um, I've probably done mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah. But I, I live in Jacksonville, Florida now. Um, I am, uh, I have two boys, four and six this week, both of them uh, around this week. And uh, oh, really? Wow. Yeah. So I've got a lot going on. I, I, <laughs> no I also, kidding. Yeah. Also own, I also own a microbrewery down in Georgia. Uh, so oh, really? got, very cool. Yeah, basically, if you want to talk about traffic, SEO, being a dad and beer, yeah. I'm, I'm your guy. <laughs> Those are all topics I love. So yeah, we could go in a lot of different directions here. <laughs> awesome. Yes. Yeah, that, that that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about the how you guys go about this? Um, because, you know, content marketing and content strategy is so important to businesses right now. We're engaging so much online digitally, uh, more than we did through any other channel. We almost have to these days, right? And and knowing where to invest those content dollars, which can be very expensive, is of course very, very important. So walk us through that, that how you guys approach it a little bit. Yeah, sure. So I think that the way I like to see, I like to walk through kind of the, the product maturity model to say, how do how do you go from idea, ideation all the way to execution with content? Um, and what are the things that we typically see with that um, decision making? And you know, I think that when teams are have to analyze what their content efficiency rates are, they have to look at every little part of that process and understand what's manual and how successful are we typically uh, with each of those things. So I'm talking about research, planning, prioritization, briefing, uh, writing and editing, and then production, publishing, and post-publish updates and maintenance on the content. All of that, every touch, every minute one spends on that has to be associated with cost. So I, I commonly talk to teams and they, you know, I say, how much do you think content costs? And they're like, I don't know, $500? And I'm like, okay, let's, um, let's probably dig not. in there. Yeah, and then you know you dig into all these costs and what's manual. What are you have good people at some things doing work that they're not good at in others, and then also the true cost of content is all that packed together. But then you got to look at effective cost of content because what if your team's only operating at a ten percent batting average, right? So they publish ten articles and only one of them is successful on average. Well, now you're five hundred, which is actually two thousand, just became twenty thousand. For an effective page, right? All in. Um, and so when we get teams thinking about that, they start to say, oh gosh, I need to get predictive 
with my planning, all right? And so the real, the one thing is, how do you decide what you create and what you update, how much you create, how much you update, why you do it? And that's the big value that we provide. But then you get a little bit further down the road and it's like, okay, well, we have inefficiencies actually building the content or in the operations part, right? So we've created a brief solution um, that gets writers and the strategists and editors in chief and, you know, search leads on the same page, right? Says, here's what we expect from you. It creates a lot less feedback cycles that can kill you. And you know, at least that what you publish is going to be uh, aligned with what the editor intended. Um, and then we have kind of applications that get to the, the most common workflows. Uh, so how do we update a page to focus on this topic better? Or what does the competitive landscape look like? What internal links should I include? Uh, what questions should I answer? So all these common things that writers get to. So what we're looking to do in a nutshell is each stage of your content life cycle, I want to accelerate each one independently so that I get the best chance of turning that 10% hit rate into 20 or 30% because that's when the money happens, right? When you can go from 10 articles, one successful, to say I get 20 out with the same team because I'm more efficient and 30% of those are successful. That's that's how I can drive 6X. There's no magic behind it. It's just a higher, higher batting average and higher slugging percentage for baseball analogies or I'm hitting more of the balls and I'm hitting them longer. Uh, yeah. basically, uh, and, and doing yeah. that with content. That's, that's why teams are successful with us. And um the cool thing about that is, is it allows me to be a product manager, content, con, you know, that kind of a background, but also take, you know, flex up with teams on these more efficiency improvements. And I think that everybody probably listening to this is like, whoa, I don't know what content to create or content might not work in my industry, or it seems like a huge investment. And, you know, there are quick wins. And then there's long-term growth needs. Um, and, and and there's not knowing what those are is the biggest risk your company can have. You find that one of your challenges when you're talking to potential clients about this is getting them to believe that you can actually get this granular. Because I think the content, like a lot of marketing in general, is some of your dollars are working, but it's impossible to know which ones are. So is that a big hurdle for you guys? It's a huge hurdle. Um, it's also a huge hurdle because your content works as like a blob and, and a, 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 cl a collection of clusters that all work together. Yeah. So I can go touch one page and it influences the whole site. Mm -hmm. And when that is, it flies in the face of, of traditional marketing attribution, right? I want to touch something and it goes up. I don't want to touch yeah. something and everything goes up. But your site acts, and I, I like to describe it as a blob or an organism, right? At each topic level. And sometimes you delete a page and it's like you pulled a tooth out and, and bad stuff's going to happen. Sometimes you create low quality pages and they actually influence your high quality pages as almost an anchor on your entire site and vice versa, right? Um, you getting a clear picture on who you are today and, and, and where your competitive advantage lies allows you to think more critically of your site as somewhat of a, like a, a living thing, um, and the big challenge there is to say, um, these aren't parlor tricks. It's truly a, uh, a way to think about quality and comprehensiveness and expertise that is fund fundamentally, you know, based in traditional marketing. It's persona development. It's buyer journey stuff. And what I feel people, the thing I heard a lot to get people over is it's not about writing something and optimizing it for the search engines. And it's some sort of trick that's going to let them win. You might get a few of those wins, but they're like house of cards type of stuff. Um, I'm trying to build for longevity and that's takes a lot of effort. And being more predictive with that is, is the way you win. If you, if you're publishing at all, right. Uh, sharpening that knife is always going to be good for the business. Yeah. Well, where do you, you talked about it a little bit, where do you draw that fine line between what our content and what our marketing can do into what the 
product itself that you're trying to drive all of this content towards what it does. I mean, they absolutely influence each other. But I think, it, you know, typically you've got these internal product teams that are building product. Then there's this marketing team, often outsourced, that is trying to drive in demand for this product. But those things should really be working in, in concert, right? They're not working together quite frequently. Um, and, you know, the worst, the worst examples of this are product team owns the product pages, right? Mm -hmm. Marketing team owns the blog. Mm -hmm. And then we've got a forum that everyone hates right and no one wants to touch and it's then we got this support site and then you have cost content for your customers very important customer content for your champions that isn't even on the site right okay i mean these, these are what i see mm -hmm. all the time and, and that's why like an align predicting return on investment is like the silo breaker for a lot of these things and the um some of the kind of basic patterns i see are where a content marketing team picks a topic, right? And they're like, okay, pre-funnel, pre-awareness, awareness, consideration, purchase, post-purchase, troubleshooting, champion development, customer. Or they're not there yet and they go, awareness, consideration, purchase. And so they're like, okay, I need a page for what is this topic I care about. I need a page for the middle of the funnel and I need a page for pricing. Done. Right. And somebody told me that I only need one page sometimes for each keyword. So I'm going to write this big old guide. And also you see a lot too. Um, when the reality is that I've got to publish the way that an expert would publish a, basically a book that illustrates expertise on the topic. So what goes into that? Right. Empathy goes into that. Right. Certainly. But I need for a particular topic, I've got to have that pre funnel awareness. What if I don't, someone doesn't know that word? What are the semantically related concepts that they might know? I got to have content that tells a story. I know those. Now it's my topic. I do need, I used to run whatis.com. I know my definitions. What is, I got that right. Um, uh -huh. and, uh, and, and then all my, all that funnel awareness, the stuff that tells the story that you know, the top. And then the middle of funnel gets creative. You got to be thinking about what are people thinking after their post-awareness on this topic? Um, it's not just about writing a couple of versus pages against your competitors and an alternatives page and a, uh, a few features and benefits details. You got to really dig in and think about that buyer journey. Because if you don't, people are going to go have that buyer journey somewhere else, right? And and right. then your, your your late funnel stuff, it, you know, you, you got to be bold. You got to be uh, focused on implementation, troubleshooting, right? Um, you know, be bold and be, be you want to be the one that defines how to fix your product. If people get into trouble on onboarding, you got to get, really, really in depth, you want to pull that into the funnel so people see that you actually care. And so that they're not finding out how to fix your product on Stack Exchange or on a forum or on Reddit, right? You, you want to own that journey. Um, and that's really where I look to focus. The one bonus round thing here from a product management perspective, and if you're a subscription business, you've got a lot of this, you got a lot of data. Data for a subscription business, whether it's SaaS or whether it's a physical product, is your blue ocean, right? That's the thing that you can bring to the world through content that no one else can. And so when teams see that, that's when product teams and marketing teams start working together. You know, whether it's the statistics about the product, whether it's the statistics about the audience, whether it's information that only you have, right? And so in, in marketing use case, it's something that I wish we did more. And I'm always pushing to say, hey, we should be doing industry analyses. We should be you know, industry content quality analysis. And it's, it's hard to get that stuff off the ground. Um, but that is truly a way to always differentiate and put that put forth that blue ocean content at every stage. So the way I like to think about it is if you're in the early stage awareness, what's the unique value only your company can provide? And that's going to bring a, a really valuable, um, not just theoretical brainstorming it's actionable stuff that can create value at all channel whether it's paid social organic you know I, I talk to teams all the time that have physical products um and middle of the funnel in a physical product is usually the hugest brainstorm session that they've never had before where you're bringing in data about how people use your product to its advantage data about sales or about something only an expert would know um, and making that 
intriguing. Um, you know, whether it's uh, you know an industry analysis company writing about a current trend, maybe you know trends. Uh, how are people researching inflation, right? Okay, or temporal stuff, or it's like something only you could do, uh, right? Like I talked about for me, content quality in this space. That's something only I can deliver. So you got to find your blue ocean and stop fighting in the, uh, here's how content marketing works, what is versus alternatives. That's the red ocean. And by when I mean say blue ocean, red ocean, I see blue ocean, you swim, it's lovely. Red ocean is bloody and all the other competitors are doing the same thing. Yeah, that's a good analogy. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I found in a lot of content, I mean, we create content. I read a plenty of others content as well. You know, there's this fine line between content being educational, right? And trying to benefit people in some way and deliver some value to them in that content between that and a sales pitch, right? Yeah. Which is just, I am skewing everything about the industry towards the problem that I say that I'm solving, right? Right. How do you, how do you walk that tightrope? Because you do need to get to your value prop at some point along the way there. But but again, you don't want to turn people off from the beginning. What's your uh, philosophy on that? Yeah, I think that um, there's a couple of ways that I like to think about that. Um, one is... Your, your content should provide unique inform and, and this is a concept stolen from uh, information retrieval, like the science of, of uh, search results, right? The, the computer science technology, information retrieval um, is called information gain, right? It's when someone's reading this page, they the thing they came in to look at, you satisfy that intent and you provide unique value that no one else can provide if possible. Or at, la at least you provide the value that was expected. Right. And so, well, that's key, you, right, right, right there. Just like whatever caused them to come to view this piece of content, a keyword, a search right. term, a, you know, whatever, deliver on that first, right? That that's the key. Well, that's the key. By the way, that's literally the key that unlocks the thing you asked for. It unlocks your ability to position then a trust driven or a, um, a, you move me in the funnel through information gain, now you've earned the right to have a successful pitch. So now what is that pitch? The pitch can be specific, okay? Get more insights like this and download our demo, um, you know, sign up for a consult consultation, uh, you know, whatever that pitch might be. It could also be what I like to reference as a content upgrade. I used to um, uh, call it a targeted download, but then someone rebranded it content upgrade, um, where I'm actually providing um, a the next things that you care about in the journey in some sort of capture mechanism. So it can be, so if I'm on a, what is X, Y, Z, right? Um, I, I'm going to think to myself, if somebody's entering and wants to learn the basics of something, well, if I've satisfied that intent, what are the next things they'll want to know? And they've trusting me with that. Maybe it's a uh, you know something that I'm considering middle of the funnel for that same. Maybe it's a downloadable guide of some sort. Maybe it's a checklist. Maybe it's something that they can share with their team. Maybe it's something that they can you know uh, share some other way. Or, and they they want to get this asset. So eBooks and things like that. So in B two B, that's very relevant. It could also be things like um, honeypots and widgets, you know, uh, calculators and, uh, you know, depending on your, um, your sweet spot. So I think that building trust by answering questions and being valuable can un unlock higher percentage conversion rates for pitches. Um, so I think lead leading with the value and saying, hey, I'm also here to make money, but you can also do that through a motion a, a sequence of motions um for you know things like early stage subscription uh and then all the way down the funnel so so who are your your tar target client profile that you guys are working with is it is it all is it b2b SaaS? is it any b2c yeah um it's anyone that has a culture of content internally i'm not going to go in and tell you that content works right i i, I like it's my, I don't have enough time in the day Our, you know, our software doesn't have enough time to sell you that the CEO is good and content's great. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you're already up over that hump. Right. And you're, and you're creating at least, you know, a couple content items a month, um, you know, or one a week, you know, you're going to be able to justify an investment in doing that better. Right. Um, and regardless of the, uh, the space that you're in, um, 
target markets for us, um, you know, it's really, like I said, it's anyone who has a cultural for content, but as far as where do we actively market, um, B2B SaaS, e-commerce, B2C, um, even uh, life sciences, healthcare, ph pharma, um, and agency are sweet spots, but also publishers and publishers whose goal is getting, you know, uh, subscription revenue or affiliate revenue are very, um, uh, are very successful with us. Um, you know, I, 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 I like to joke around and say, it's like, if you care about content, we can make it work. Um, but you know, if the key being, if you think SEO can work, if you think content can work for your team, you're likely going to be able to make it work. Um, if you think that you're just trying to trick Google, I can point you to a $49.99 a month software product that can make you believe you're going to. Um, and uh, that's probably where you're at right now. Uh, yeah, it's right. okay. It's mm -hmm. okay. I mean, go for it. Uh, yeah. You might you might get some good stuff. You might get some lucky breaks. Um, but if you're really investing in, you know, a dedicated person or more for writing uh, and or the equivalent of that through outsourcing and people are thinking about content internally, and trying to achieve particular goals, you're going to be a winner. Tell me about what types of content are working today. Obviously, you know, there's the written blogs and posts and the, all those types of things. But what about video? What about podcasts? What, you know, what, what are you seeing being effective right now? Uh, great question for Jeff. Um, so uh, there's a there's a thing. I, I, there's a, a talk I do on the, uh, it's the seven planes of rich media optimization hell, all right? Um, and uh, it, it walks through the, the the quandaries involved in video and audio and and, and podcast and um, podcast and, and and also other types of rich media. Um, and because there's still a um, technology gap for um, for video retrieval for computer vision, computer vision is the science of looking at images or moving pictures and, and pulling out information from what you see. So that's like how, you know, uh, Google Lens, if, for example, would be an example of computer vision. Um, so it's important for you to market your videos and your other rich media through the channels that you expect it to be viewed as a video, right? So think, how do you market for YouTube? How do you market for podcast uh, distribution channels? But if you're looking to do that for search, right, the playbook gets a little bit more complex because you're in the, uh, you're, you're writing descriptions, you're writing show notes, as it were, if you're in a podcast, you're also, you're also getting raw transcription, right, and you put into a role to repurpose all of the outcomes of this discussion or, or the podcast discussion. Um, so how can you take that massive payload of the description, the show notes, or the video description, or all those, those things, get the most out of it, get the most pieces of content for the most types of readers, learners. So repurposing is very, very critical. Uh, cleaning up, um, in that specific case, cleaning up transcripts, adding annotation, uh, integrating it with the rest of your site, integrating it with other uh, podcast transcription, um, building content, that supports the transcript transcription building content that maybe you skip the section add it as editorial commentary and maybe link to another post that you're writing so treating it like raw materials that need to be cleaned and cleansed and then also thinking about this your rich media item no matter what it is is one unit that you spent a lot of money energy and time on right you're allowed right. to get as many ways in to it. Content upgrades is one example. If you do, if you spend ten grand on an ebook, you better believe you better make it a whole lot of ways in. And I give the I always give this example two two examples. One, I once took a, bo a book, two hundred and something page book, turned it into a thousand page website. Right, that's one. The other one is I took a podcast company who had three hundred episodes, and I forty x their subscription base through transcription, transcription optimization. Those two examples are the answer to your question. Yes, if you're they investing, are. If you're investing in podcasts and you're mm -hmm. not doing transcription at least, that's the third plane. You got okay. podcast show notes, description show notes, transcription, okay? If you're not doing at least that, mm -hmm. do it now. 
yesterday. Um, mm-hmm. And then from there, start getting more creative, more creative, more creative um, with the way that you repurpose that payload, that that raw material. Um, so didn't really answer your question now, but that's one angle on it. I'm going to answer your question specifically, though, now. Okay. It's okay. Reper- reper- for small teams, repurposing is critical to become a discipline. So how can you get the most for your buck? If you're mm-hmm. getting someone to write, you know, 1,000 page, 10,000 page opus, turn that into as many angle shots that you can, turn it in any formats. So you can catch all learner types. You can catch all um, uh, maybe angle shifts. Like maybe you wrote a general guide. You want to angle it for each target audience. So uh, CRM, CRM for coffee companies, CRM for figure out a way to get the most for the investment in the super high quality stuff through target audience matrixing, through buyer journey matrixing, through make it into a video, <laughs> make it into an audio, uh, yeah. those yeah. types of things. That, that can be wildly successful sh- for small teams. Yeah. The, the thing that, thing that I'm kind of picking up on here that I think to what you're saying is that this, this content that you're creating should link itself together and really take this person on a journey. Because I think it's common to say, I'm going to go write a, uh, I'm going to write a piece of content on the topic, or I'm going to record a video on a, p- a piece of topic or a topic. And you do that and then wait for the results to come in. But I think what you're saying is, yeah, th- this should then take that person maybe to different places and, and give them more of what they're looking for. Yes. And if you're not providing that value and it's not in a com- competitive conflict, pointing them to get that value where it can be found if you're not doing it also. So having no externals on your site is a super weird signal, right? If you have non-competitive externals and it's providing that next part of the journey in a way that, you know, isn't, you don't want to link to Wikipedia. You don't want to link to your competitors, um, but you're, you can confidently do that if you're not going to fulfill that goal too. Um, and yes, your, every page you create on a topic and related topics is part of a blob. I like to say, right. It's a blob of pages. So you pull one page out, it can hurt the entire organism. Um, you add a page, it can actually influence all the other pages. If you add a page that's high quality, it might take the weight off of some of your weaker stuff. You add low quality stuff, a lot of it, it can hurt the good stuff. Um, and that, take that to the bank. That's not just Jeff's speculation. It's real talk, right? Some people, oh no, you know, this, I can do this over here. So what does that mean? It means you can't get away with low quality content and you never could. Now it's in vogue and everybody thinks it's cool, right? And so, you know, they can listen to, 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 to this type of advice. Um, but it's not saying go delete all your stuff. It's saying level it up, get it into a place where you're comfortable with it. It doesn't mean it has to all be long. It just means it all has to be valuable. It doesn't mean it all has to be video or it doesn't all have to be text. It just means that if someone gets to that page, they need to feel good about themselves after they experience it. Um, and if you can set that bar for yourself, everything is going to start working better and everybody's going to like each other because nothing's worse than people say SEO content. First, it's like the biggest debasing phrase. It, it basically says your entire industry is garbage, right? It, it, it's an illustration that there's siloing in your organization. It's such a bad signal. Um, and so like, or marketing content or, you know, product content, right? Sometimes some of those things, product content doesn't need to have any results associated with it. Marketing content, that's what generates our leads and it's our pitch. The CEO content, I don't know, just gets us rankings, right? You got to get to the point where I don't really care where, who makes it, where it's about, as long as it's valuable. And I can map it to my, you know, to the, my goals as a business. If I can do that, it doesn't mean it has to get a lot of traffic. It can be the page that you link to from the page that gets lots of traffic. But it's, it's wayfinding value is enough to make it good for our business, right? Every page needs a why. Every page needs a why. That's it. That's the punchline of everything I do. <laughs> and you know what? I built software that gives you the why. Fun fact. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's just the whole thing. That's the, yeah. that's, well, that's the elevator pitch. There you go. <laughs>
Well, let's talk about how you uh, how you monetize that product. I mean, you guys yourselves are a subscription company, right? You you put mm-hmm. their, your clients on some sort of re- recurring model. Why did you choose to go that route over, say, you know, per project or some sort of maybe consulting based approach? We've we've rolled we've rolled our company. So I've been around. We've been around for over seven years. Um, we've teeter tottered through a lot of different models, and um, currently our go to market is a annual subscription um where and it's still we have a free offering and then where teams will product qualify through using the platform in certain ways that exhibit expertise um then they we will know they're going to be successful we also can sell direct into that premium offering um in the near future we are going to re-enter the self-service product led uh paid subscription um we had offerings in the past to test the waters here and there we finally think we have that nut cracked with the um kind of end user offering right now our offering is sold directly to the kind of the decision maker um not to the writer or the seo or the you know um the junior editor um but those are the people that get a lot of value out of it so what we're doing is we're we're aiming to craft a solution what that they could drag their credit card out and buy it and expense it too in addition yeah. to still having that premium offering for the editor-in-chief of the same organization right um so why we chose that is because you know services are are always in a SaaS company services are always going to have they are a need uh reluctant need effectively the reluctant need when a product's being built, because the product will always have gaps. And what you want to get to in a subscription model is a packaging and usage experience, using ex- user experience where it's packaged enough that you're able to do product led onboarding and product led support. Right. And then when you stretch with services, that's not ideal. Right. So, but when you're building a product, you're going to have major gaps that you have to fill with customer success, with support, with manual training, with manual onboarding. And so we've gone through that journey. Um, And right now with with our premium offering, we still require some training and onboarding for those larger teams. And so it is a a hybrid uh, sales-led growth and product-led growth approach. But the journey always gets to how can you be, you know, how can you turn yourself into a Slack, right? I mean, Slack's PQL moment is when a team of more than X people uh, transmit, I think it's like 4,000 messages, right? Okay, you got to get to the point where the packaging you're able to provide can have that that hook line, that PQL moment if you are if you want to go to product-led subscription. Um we're always on that journey and you know, it's hard, man, you got to figure that out. And so for anyone who's who do subscriptions, you got to have that moment. You got to figure out what that uh, free to paid moment is. And that is um, what we are always battling the market on <clears throat> battling the, uh, the product market maturity, the competitive market maturity for us, that line always moves and we have to decide or go to market based on that line. Yeah. Well, okay. So for the average SaaS product manager, how would you advise they go about evaluating that, right? If this is something that's in the free offering, if it's in this tier, if it's in that tier, right? Where do you, where do you put some of these features? Uh, I love it. I love the question. Um, the, the, the thing I would look, be looking at is can your end user buy, right? Um, can your end, at what's the what is the highest price point your end user can buy at? What's the lowest price point um, for if there's any comparables? Um, and um, are you also aiming to uh, sell something for that focuses on teams, right? As well. Um, and what it, what is the what are the values that the end user has? What are the values that the team has? Um, and Make sure so there's there's two strategies, right? There's a there's a wedge, uh, and then there's a tease, right? So the wedge is where you actually block the end user from seeing the value of the team product, right? Um, 
the other one is the tease. You tease the end user uh, to turn them into a, uh, a viral uh, transmitter to the rest of their organization. Um, so you're teasing that value. They may not get that value, but you're teasing it through. So the way that I would think about it is know your end user to not get esoteric, right? Not, know your end user, um, know the value, the differentiated value that they desire um, and build uh, your entry package around that specific thing. Um, and then move from there. Um, but if you can nail that, it's a really, really great bridge. I wish I had had the um, luxury of doing that with my software uh, offering, but I didn't um, because the mar we were building a brand new uh, market space that no one else had seen. Mm -hmm. Product had gaps in you know 2015 to 17 that we had to fill with services. So we couldn't afford to mm -hmm. not have it be a sales-led offering. Um, and what you see as markets mature is the ability for a product offering to uh, come in and be kind of a, a traditionally uh, not sales led. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Does that um, makes sense. Or am, I, am I saying all these? I, I love to say lots of jargon. Was that too jargony? <laughs> no. No. Okay. No. Good. Very good. relevant. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. Well, I, I'm curious, you know, you just talked about maybe you're going to offer some different uh, variations of the product to try to, you know, get directly down to the decision makers or not the decision makers, but rather, and, rather yeah. the people that get the most value out, out of the product. Um, are there any other big, you know, uh, changes to the product or or new uh, new offerings that you guys are going to be coming to market with here in the near future? One correction of what you said. So the key is decision makers value is the highest value. Right. 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 The writer, the writer, the know, bill. they can get little, <laughs> they can get little, lots of small values over and over again to become ubiquitous. Right. So in our case, yes. Uh, so that's the equivalent of, you know, a user of Salesforce versus the Salesforce subscription that you buy yeah, for your right, entire team. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And so the user, you know, yeah. can't go buy Salesforce for themselves. Right. If they do it, it's, it's a weird experience. So, um, but can you build something? Is is there a one person CRM that would make sense for an individual who is also part of a team? We don't, you know, that, that those are the types of experiences. So what are we doing right now? We're improving the editor experience. We're in, improving our ideation and our research experience, right? Um, so that we can um, have a direct entry into writers and editors' experiences. But what we're also doing at the same time is for the CMOs and for the editors in chief, we're um, making everything, we're always trying to make everything faster um, and also um, more predictive uh, and more aligned with quantified value. Um, so there's aspirational value and quantified value and it's hard to sell aspirational value uh, to, uh, to a decision maker. Um, it's easy to sell aspirational value to an end user uh, in order to get a lots of money from somebody, just bluntly, you better be able to uh, deliver a prediction of quantified value. Um, because if you can't, your risks are very high. You turn yeah, risks right. Yeah. And so the end user side, it's about, you know, my experience today. Do I love using this thing? Does it make my life better? Um, and for a CMO, it still does it make my business make more money? than I put in. Um, and so I think the two ways that we're operating right now is let's make everything easier to understand, easier to use for both parties. Quantified value up here, a, um, a more accelerated experience down there. Sure, sure. okay. Well, uh, we've covered a heck of a lot of ground today, but um, if the if any listeners have maybe some questions and want to follow up on anything we talked about today and just want to learn more about Market Muse, um, where, where are the places they can go? Uh, Jeff at marketmuse.com. Shoot me an email, uh, Jeffrey underscore Coil on Twitter. I'm also very active on LinkedIn. Um, if you want to go uh, prices right, go, go sign up for our free offering. Okay. Um, go check out th <laughs> those are those page level editor, writer, um, SEO experiences. You can check those out. 
Um, and uh, also you can book, uh, book a demo right on our site and that'll be personalized. It'll give you some insights. I always like to say our, uh, usually with a demo with us, we'll, you'll walk away with at least a couple quick wins for your site. So it's worth the price of admission of $0. Um, but uh, yeah, if you're, if you're interested in that or any sort of uh, questions about search content uh, or anything in between, um, look me up. All right, awesome. Lots of ways to engage there. Uh, yeah, Jeff, really enjoyed the conversation today. Very, very insightful and uh, appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to come on. So thanks again. I appreciate it. And it's great to meet you, uh, Nick, finally in person or as close to in person as this can as possibly be. As close to in person as we yeah, right? tend to get these days. I hear you. I'll talk hear to you, you soon. Sure. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Jeff.